many media members understand that, that things could go wrong, that things could happen where Argentina get knocked down in quarters. Now, mm. is it an unsuccessful World Cup? That ends up being a bitter taste in the mouth, but you know, it's, it's, it, it, depending on how the other matches went, anything can happen in quarters and semis and of course in the final. Yeah. So when you look at it from that perspective, you know, they're happy with what they were able to do. The, the, the 20, uh, 28 years of, of, of not winning, a, you know, international trophy ended last year with winning the Copa America. So, so for them, Messi already has been able to establish that legacy. This team has been able to establish a legacy themselves. Uh, so anything after that ends up being an addition because they know that it, it, it's a very difficult competition to be able to win, especially when you have a Brazil facing the moment they have and knowing that, there's so many teams that can come in in good form. And at the same time, there's so many teams that are coming in limping. Hi, uh, morning, evening, viewers, wherever you are across the world. Uh, today is a very special episode from all of us at One Stop Albu Celeste. Uh, and then uh, continuing our series of Road to Qatar. This is the fifth episode that we bring to you. And we have a very special guest with us alongside Indonath and Sid, who you see here on screen. Sid is joining us for the first time as part of the series. Sid is, in fact, the founder and the visionary who started the One Stop Elvis Realistic Collective, bringing all of us together. And talking about bringing all of us together, really happy to bring together Juan here. And, and I do have a ready-made scoop from the internet introduction for Juan, but I want to let you speak about yourself. Uh, who you, and just two points I want to know about you. One, your journey in this yes. 20, 20 plus years of your uh, coverage yeah. of football and the game and your connection yeah. to Elvis Realistic and the Argentina team. Just want to know about that. Okay. Well, actually, I, I ended up going to Argentina to go study. Mm -hmm. I did a study abroad there. And um, eventually what ended up happening was that I, I met someone. That's usually okay. the, 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 the story. You know, you end up meeting someone and you end up, you know, the, the whole process after that. I lived there for about two years, um, had, a, had a kid. And, uh, you know, my wife is Argentine. My daughter's Argentine. And um, I'm not. <laughs> I was born in the U.S., but my, okay. my family's Colombian. I'm Colombian. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, ever since I was a kid, um, you know, he, he, I had my older cousins, much older than me, about 10, 15 years older than me, were huge Boca fans. And mm -hmm. um, he, and, and they would have uh, posters of Gatti. I mean, you, we're going back to the 19, I mean, people that... Uh, I started following book in the 1970s. You know, you, you start talking about Gatti and Brindisi and Maradona and, and, and all those types of, you know, Chapa Suñé. All of those players were part of, that, of those teams in the 1970s when they won the Libertadores in the late 70s, especially. That yeah. was my influence, basically. And, um, of course, it continued as, as I got older and, and uh, got into journalism. And, and it's been part of the case ever since then. I mean, that's my connection. As far as journalistically, I, I really yeah. never went to journalism school. So, so sometimes I, I feel uncomfortable to this day saying that I'm a journalist because I don't think I have the background for it. But yeah. uh, it, I mean, if you, if you go to, uh, if you're educated at university level, if you have some type of, of education in terms of, of deductive reasoning of critical thinking and, and you can write, well, that ends up helping out a great deal as well. So, so from that perspective, I did a lot of research. I graduated with a degree in history and, and a minor international relations. So Part of that does end up involving some sort of investigation, some type of critical thinking, some type of, of opinion making, if you will. And it fit in. And, uh, you know, I got into football and, and uh, to this day, it's, it's probably one of the weirdest ways to get into football. And uh, I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you that story some other time or, you know, I don't, I don't want to sure. take up too much of that time because I know there's a lot of topics you want to delve into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We want to uh, intro the uh, said any questions for res corresponding to Juan's uh, introduction or yeah. before I no, tell I think, him. Uh, you know, as I said, that just you still spent uh, two years you married to an Argentine. But say for us, we are far away from Argentina. But uh, so we live in India. I happen to be lucky to have spent some time in Buenos Aires and actually uh, seen a Boca game. But I was yeah. there for a month uh, for a you know for a work related assignment which wasn't related to football, but, you know, far, far away from the land, 
you will find, uh, and you will see that you know in south one of the southern state there is a messy cutout in a pond, the lake. So there's a huge following uh, of uh, Argentina in India. So uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So it's just incredible. So there is that's the bond which probably put all of us here together. Uh, I mean, I, I've heard it from people. I mean, I haven't had done. I, I've only. I've not only done interviews with people in India. I've done p interviews with people in Malaysia. Mm. I've done interviews with people in in, in Singapore and China, and, and they tell me that uh, very similar stories about that. And um, I mean, if you if you if you go from a South American perspective, Argentina and Brazil ended up being the two countries that ended up exporting a lot, not only just to Europe, not only to Mexico or or, or other parts of the world, but to South America itself. Especially when you start delving back into the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, especially in the 1940s and 1950s, when uh, many players left Argentina to go to places like Colombia. Colombia had uh, been uh, disassociated from, from FIFA at that point, and they had basically a league where you, know, you had some of the best football being played back in the, 19, in, in the uh, late 1940s, early 1950s. And uh, you had Di Stefano playing in Colombia. You had ma yeah. many, uh, you had. Um, you know, you had uh, several of the big stars of Argentine football of that time going to Colombia to play. And same thing it, it, with Brazilians as well. And uh, it was a league where that influence ended up being very great, where you have a lot mm. of kind of what you have in, in India as well, maybe to a greater extent, maybe to a lesser extent, where you have camps that many support the national team, but then their second team is Argentina or their second team is Brazil. To, yeah. to such an extent, or it's Boca or it's River to, yeah, yeah. to a certain extent, or, or yeah. depending on how many Colombians end up playing at Boca, how many Colombians play at River, then there's where the, the, the balance ends up shifting in towards one team or the other. So there, yeah. there's been a lot of influence there. And, and I mean, everything from uh, the World Cup in Malaysia, 1997, uh, the under 20 World Cup back in 1979, yeah. all those events ended up being pivotal for following of Argentina, of Argentine teams, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. yeah, and especially in India, you know, the first uh, World Cup, which was covered in Indian television fully, was 1986. Mm -hmm. 1980, there were some knockout games. So that 1986 World Cup and Diego Maradona's heroics, uh, till yeah. then, so my elder people in the family were all Brazil supporters because they read mm -hmm. about Pele, uh, Garincha, uh, of the teams of the you know 50s and 60s. Yeah, And there was a film that came, uh, Giants of Brazil, which was... A screen. So there was nothing. But for our generation, our first World Cup, when we were still very, very young, we saw Maradona uh, scoring those goals in England and Belgium. So yeah. that started that. And then, you yeah. know, Kanijia, Batistuta, there was a series of players who had... Also, I think it helped, you know, the, in fact, uh, one you will be interested to know, that Pele, in fact, had visited India in 1977 as part of Cosmos. Yeah. And played against yeah. Mon Bagar. Then Maradona had also visited a couple of times, in fact. And Messi, in fact, Messi's first match as a captain against Venezuela, it happened in Calcutta. Was in India. Was yeah. in I, I remember Calcutta. that. Match. I, I yeah, remember yeah, seeing yeah. that match. I mean, that, yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, that's a hometown. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> in, in 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 Brazil's case, I mean, you can go to Africa too. You know, the, the tours that Santos did back in the 1950s and 60s, yeah. uh, the tours that Brazil did back in the in that area as well. Ended up yeah. being major influences, so much Huge. so that in the Caribbean, if you go as well, places like Haiti, places like Jamaica, Brazil is the team because Brazil yeah. would go and play friendlies there. And, and that was such a big influence as far as yeah. that following was concerned. Yeah, like Ka Kafu, yeah. in fact, as I speak, was in the town yesterday over the weekend, uh, just for a promotion yes. team for the World Cup. And again, he got like Kafu is one of those like deadly Brazilian influencers uh, that they see exist. Okay, anyway, jumping now one into the questions corresponding to Qatar, right? And then, like you guessed, we have a series of them, and without wasting any further time, jumping to the first one. So, I think the first one, first question that we have for you, and want your perspective on that is regarding the timing of this World Cup, which is completely different from the other editions earlier, right? So, in the middle of the club season. So what do you think are the implications because of that? Of course, one aspect that we are seeing is the injuries that are happening, some of them. But are we reading too much into it? Have there always been injuries at the end of the season going into the World Cup every four years? Uh, what, what's your take on that? It's a bit of both, I think. It's, it's a bit of, 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 yeah, the injuries are starting to stockpile. But they're going to stockpile now. They're going to stockpile in April and May. It's not a case of when the World Cup is being played. It's the amount of matches that are being played overall that end up being, uh, to me, at least a factor. 
because many of these same injuries that you're seeing, you're probably going to see them in April and May as well, because just because there's, let's say hypothetically, there is no World Cup in, in, in November. Hmm. Matches will still continue. Champions Correct. League will still continue. Everything else around the world is still going to continue because the calendar, oh, well, let's give them a month off. It's not going to happen. Okay, mm -hmm. You're still going to have Boxing Day. You're still going to have matches on, on December 1st if you're in the Premier League. If, if you have matches in La Liga, yeah, you'll have a break in December, but that doesn't mean that the grind ends up being any less because instead of the grind being in December and January, for Spanish teams, for example, the grind ends up being in January and February, yes. even February especially. So it's more of a case of the calendar itself. Where do you fit it in? And mm -hmm. let, let's be honest, too, because the same issue starts to happen every two years when you have the African Cup of Nations and some of the players that come in, maybe mm -hmm. not injured, but also yeah. a bit beleaguered and a bit weary because of the travels they had to do within Africa, between the African continent and traveling back to Europe and the training that they had to do and the conditions as well. African teams, you know, just like South American teams, they have very difficult conditions which we, they have to try and play in order to qualify. Europeans have it a lot easier. Let, let's be completely and utterly honest. At most, they have to travel three yes. hours. At most. Yeah. African yeah. teams don't have that luxury. Asian yeah. teams don't have that luxury. Let's be yeah. quite honest. Let's say India plays Australia. It's not a two-hour flight. When, when a lot of these points of view are put, they're very Europeanized. Yes. They're Can very I... Euro Eurocentric. It ends up being something that, that needs to be talked about. It's, it's not just where the World Cup is being played. It's how everything else is being played as well. Because... Yeah. You're not you're not taking away games. You're even adding more tournaments. You're even adding more friendlies. You're even adding more FIFA dates or more matches to FIFA dates. So I think it's more that than when the World Cup is being played. Got it. Got it. Yeah. Uh, into the, into the, anything to add? I said anything to add to that? No, I think I, I, just just I, one I, question I, while you you uh, re re reflect on that. How do you think Argentina yeah. is handling the two or three injuries that we have had? Los Celso, Di Maria, Dybala as well. Especially what? I'd say Los Celso. Well, Dybala looks like he'll be back. Di Maria yeah. looks yeah. like he'll be back. He was training it's yesterday Lucelso. or something. There was a picture. Yeah. Lo Celso is the yeah. one that's a doubt. Now, right. yeah. the issue with Lo Celso is the fact that he ends up not wanting to have surgery because he knows he'll be out for an extended period of time. Now, if he continues with that same injury, he can end up getting progressively worse until after the World Cup, and he wouldn't be available until quarterfinals to begin with. Mm. Now, that being said, if there is one thing about Argentina that we have right now, or that we can see right now, as as, as you know, from a neutral standpoint, from from a fan standpoint, in some cases, is that it's deep enough in the midfield to be able to bring in someone to replace him. Case in point, Enzo mm -hmm. Fernandez, who is probably mm -hmm. one of the best midfielders right now in, in in all of European football, and and because of what he's been able to do so far in 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 the Portuguese league, and also the demand that he's starting to get over in the Premier League as well as La Liga. Uh, to okay. me, I see him. I see him in Spain before I see him in the Premier League, but again, that's just me. Uh, but Enzo Fernandez has been able to show some tremendous play, not just in the Portuguese League, yeah. but also in Champions League as well. That's what's been able to attract so much attention in his way. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I think Enzo is a, I mean, it's a great prospect, but I think what, uh, you know, in Scaloni's scheme of things, uh, Lochelso kind of plays uh, a very creative role and he connects with yeah. Messi really, really well. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think. He will be missed, but that's a reality. I mean, every team misses some player or the other. Yeah, of course. Whether if the World Cup is in winter or in summer. So, mm -hmm. yeah, we'll have to. And, and, and he, are... and, and, but the thing is, Lo Celso is such, a, such, a, such an integral part of that midfield. It's not that you're just missing another midfield. Yes, yes. It, you're, yeah. you're, you're missing a, a, a pretty much a, a cornerstone, a keystone of, of that midfield alongside Paredes. You know, and, and, and you, you and end up ball. seeing... Yeah, and you end up... It, at times, yeah, okay, maybe depending on the context of the match, you can bring in Enzo Fernandez, you can bring in Papu Gomez, Papu you can Gomez, bring in yeah. those types of players that, that can end up making a difference in terms of, of the attack or even from a defensive standpoint. But that, that that's, again, the positive of having such a deep side when you're Argentina, but not only yes. deep, a, a deep side that each and every player understands a role. Correct, yeah. Yeah, in fact, uh, what are, yes, said you please go ahead. You see. Yeah, some people are strangely connecting Ezequiel Palacios could fill in that role, although I don't feel as confident as some people who are pointing at that out. But what are your thoughts on that one? He could, but I don't think he's at that level. He, he he's been able to to grow as much, you know, since since he's gone into the Bundesliga compared to what Enzo Fernandez has been able to do over the past year and a half. 
and, and I think that that's where you start seeing. And, and it's not me. This is not me giving an opinion. It's, it's me giving an opinion, plus many in Argentina observing the fact that now you start to see Enzo Fernandez step into the world. And he stepped in quickly. It's not only that, that you know, oh, well, he's learning as he goes. No, he jumped in and he's basically understood what he needs to do in the midfield so far under Leo Scaloni. He's had, what, two matches under his belt, but it's still enough for him to be able to understand exactly what's going through. And on top of that, he's been able to add the speed of the European game to be able to really understand that dynamic and execute it at the best level possible. Absolutely, right. absolutely. I mean, the, the Palacios of uh, River, we know, is, is quite different to the Palacios of yes, Bundesliga. Yes, you're absolutely right. And, 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 the, and the Fernandes of River was at a very high level, but now you see him at an even higher level over at Benfica. Yeah, he kind of stepped up his game. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Cool. One, uh, the next question, and, and guys, for both of you as well, uh, about Messi. Like, and Messi, uh, the aspect of leadership about him. What do you think mm -hmm. has happened to the man in the last three, four years? Like, uh, maybe with Scaloni coming in, or it was just sort of happening to him, that he just seems to be way more involved in the national team than he ever was. It just seems like that. And, 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 and what is he doing differently so that he's ensuring that the team is gelling together? What's your perspective, Juan? And then, yeah, you guys can please add your perspective as well. When you start learning about leadership, you end up learning about different types of leadership. Now, is one type of leadership, is, is leadership one size fits all? No, it's not. And it depends on, on, on the situation. It depends on the moment. It depends on, on the group which type of leader you need. Sometimes you need a, a leader that cracks the whip. Sometimes you need, you need a leader that pats you on the back. And, and Messi's more, you know, everybody go forward, I'll stay back kind of leader where he's like looking and saying, okay, this is the best decision to be able to take, to, to carry forward. People compare him a lot to Cristiano Ronaldo because uh, of what they've been able to do about their respective pedigrees. But they have, they're so different as, different. as individuals Ready. that that you can't, really compare them i mean does is one source of leadership good maybe is it better than the other i don't think so maybe maybe not it depends because you putting cristiano ronaldo in argentina maybe he's going to get rejected by everybody you put messi in portugal and maybe it doesn't run yeah. the same way so right. depending on the team depending on the players that you have around that ends up being one of the the, the, the arguments that you have as i said does he get involved now yeah because he is the elder statesman he is mm. the one that, that comes in. But now, start remembering matches before the 2018, 2018 World Cup and before that. Yeah. Every time Messi had the ball, did you look at the teammate? Did you look at his teammates? No, what were they doing? No. They were looking at him, waiting for him to do something. It was almost like that. They, they, they were always, okay, yeah. do something. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Bail us out. And, and, and you know what? In football, you can, you can do that, but you can't do that all the time. Here, take the ball. I don't know what to do with it. Yeah. And of course, you see that infamous picture in the Copa America in, in 2016 when he had nine players around him. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, we shut down Messi. We, we, we won half the battle. Yeah. And, yeah. Which basically they did. So when you have the pressure of having to be the savior, when you have the pressure of having to be the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth option, when you have to be the only player that steps up, and you usually end up being, and you get shut down when you end up having to not only solve the issues that are going on inside the pitch, but you end up being blamed for many of the things that are going outside the pitch. Remember that, that, that um, before the world cup in 2018, that friendly against Israel, Messi's oh getting God. some yeah. of the blame for it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And he had, so when you're getting blamed for things that are extracurricular, when you get blamed for things that are going on outside of football, when you're getting all those types of pressures, when the media, and mind you, Argentine media in terms of football is a 24-hour news cycle. It's not something that is that is that it, that stops. Yeah. 2017 during the World Cup qualifiers, they weren't talking about just Argentina qualifying or not qualifying for the World Cup. They're saying Argentina qualifying or not qualifying for the World Cup had implications in the Argentine presidential elections in the next year. Yeah. So that's additional pressure. Yeah. If I win or if I lose, then it has an impact on presidential. Damn, that, that, that takes a lot. 
And it takes a yeah. lot on your family and it takes a great deal on your friends and it takes a great deal out of you. And, and just uh, and Udoda, coming point. to you, but just, just it's, uh, adding something and it's fascinating listening to you and a different perspective on a different part of the world almost uh, that he's not the only leader on the pitch in this team. Mm-hmm. It seems like there are other leaders like mm-hmm. like Debu behind even Licha or let's someone and earlier he was only Master Reno who was there who was probably in terms of leadership qualities uh, and body language would come close to Messi. Now there is a Rodrigo De Paul who is a leader himself, right? So mm-hmm. I think that also helps. It takes up a lot, takes out away a lot of pressure from Messi's shoulders and which wasn't there earlier. That, that's that's one thing. No, also the guys like say uh, Rodrigo De Paul or a yes. Faraday yeah. who kind of or even everybody else, they kind of almost like Messi is our leader and we are here to protect him. So that kind of thing. Yeah. People are giving comments yeah. that we are going to war for Messi. Yeah. So I think yeah. this group is very special and I think the leadership style of Messi that you would once say is a different, it is flourishing uh, under this leadership uh, group of uh, people, I guess. One connected question to this, uh, the Messi's Coloni combo, like we have had many managers who are going into, uh, you know, World Cups. Scaloni seems to be doing something right. That's what the streak is obviously on. What is it that, that is working between Scaloni and Messi? He understands how to manage a group. He understands that he needed people with experience around him. If you look at the coaching staff, mm. you know, you have... Yeah. Samuel, uh, you have a Walter Samuel, you have Ayala. Uh, Roberto Ayala. Even if you look down at the under 17s and under 20s, you have Javier Mascherano as the under 20s coach. Uh, Pablo Imar is the under 17 coach. Diego Placente is the under 15 coach. So you have that and you have players with experience. You have players that you bring in. I'll, I'll mind you, I, I'm not sure if Mascherano is going, at, 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 but I know Pablo Imar will be part of, of, of the, the contingency mm-hmm. going to Qatar. Diego Placente might be as well. Like I said, I'm not sure about Mascherano. Most likely he will be. But it, it, it's the consolidation of an idea. It's actually the acquisition of an idea. Because before it was just like, well, let's see what Messi can do. And then we'll kind of, you know, ride his coattails and see where he, he can take us. Yeah. Or how far we can go. Maybe some of us will chip in here and there. And then this team has a purpose. Like you guys said, they yeah. have a why. That's like, hey, we That's want him. Messi to win the World Cup. I mean, yeah. you hear it from, from them all the time saying, what do you, we want Leo to win it. They, they yeah. say that exactly. before we want to win it. We want him to win it. Yeah. And that, yeah. I guess, is a major driver for this team. Yeah. 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 And, and it's great that you bring that point up because we Indians, of course, the first sport that we follow is cricket. And I don't know how, how much you are into cricket, but uh, the god of cricket in Indian terms is Sachin Tendulkar. And back in 2011, when the Cricket World Cup happened, uh, mm-hmm. a similar analogy was there. He was playing for 22 years. But he hadn't won a World Cup yet. And then the team sort of rallied behind it to do it for him. And, you go and, and, and yeah. we, at the heart, heart of hearts, are hoping that it's a similar thing sort of happening in yeah. Qatar. In yeah, Qatar. I, mean, I mean, it makes it easier for you because saying, okay, what can I do to help? Yes. Yeah. Especially this group, and I keep talking about it, they not only mm-hmm. look like a very strong unit, these guys play together. They went to vacation together, part, big part of their, probably put you on spot, you are among the new guys. Some of these guys are playing from some time. Um, but among the new guys, uh, do you see somebody who's uh, kind of coming out as a really outshining? Uh, for example, do you think? I mean, we talked about Enzo Perez, but what about say uh, Alvarez, Juan Alvarez? How? What kind of yeah. role that somebody new uh, you you expect them to play? I mean, will they be significant or they'll just be a small addition when needed? Oh, Julian Alvarez will be a, a sensational addition coming off the bench. Or if, if, let's say, Lautaro Martinez doesn't want to play, he, he can come in. Oh, no, no, he, he can step in. And he's already shown that he, he can be supremely dynamic. You don't even have to see what he's done on the national team. You see what he's done at City. If you can replace Haaland, yeah, he can. Yes, it is good, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, like, it's good, I mean yeah. Ima- imagine, imagine you bring in a player for God knows how much. I forgot how much they, they, they bought Haaland for. And then you have Julian Alvarez playing, starting four matches consecutively because, well, you know, we just can do that. Yeah, and, and we'll, we'll give him a rest, no problem. And he'll play four matches, and 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 he'll come off the bench, and he'll he'll serve Holland or, or or and vice versa. So it ends up being all of those types of things with with him. Uh, Garnacho starting to show. I mean, there, there was talk some people on social media saying, "Well, we have to make a petition for Alejandro yeah, Garnacho to be one of the twenty six. <laughs> Uh, that's still a long ways to go, but he's shown some interesting things. Though I mean, that, even, today, to say that. even today, even he was today, playing with him. Yeah, he was which inexplicably, I mean, I even said on the broadcast that I said inexplicably, Eric Tenag takes him out of the match, and I'm like, 
Yeah. He was probably ar- he was arguably your best player, and Correct. you take him out quickly. Uh, on the on the uh, you know other teams, so like who would stand out for you? Like in our previous episodes, one we were looking at Denmark. They again have a similar purpose, like you know rallying behind for Eriksen, right? Much like mm-hmm. Messi, for example. Or let's say Netherlands mm-hmm. looks good. France, of course, has a great deep depth in the squad. So who would be your yeah. all out teams? Well, France as a defending champ, but then France has this weird dynamic where they end up winning a world cup or getting to a final and then crashing out the next one or something along those lines. So you don't know. Uh, Spain could be interesting, although I don't see them having those types of players that can truly make this sensational difference like they did in the previous generation. Now here's one that I, I've actually thought about a lot. Senegal, look at their, look at their entire roster. Okay. And, and, and can you honestly tell me that there's, that they're any, I mean, they're just two, three, four notches below anybody else. I mean, no. just look at their starting lineup. Yeah. Okay. And the last African Cup, they were sensational. And yeah. I think, yeah, I mean, I was reading something that then Senegal might just end up being the only African uh, uh, team to qualify from the group stage, but they could go farther. They could yeah, go I, And I agree. Stage. And I would agree. Yeah. I would totally yeah. agree with that. Because if you look at who they play on the other side, It ends up being an England side that comes in kind of limping a U.S. side that you really don't know what you're going to get with them. I mean, it's, they don't have an easy group, mind you, because obviously having the Netherlands, having the host nation and also having Ecuador, which ends up being kind of the wild card in all of this, Mm. they could easily get to quarterfinals, maybe even start to fight for semis Mm. or they could get knocked out in the first round. You just don't know. But if you look at the, if you look on paper, what this team does consist of, mind you, their, their squad, is nothing to thumb your nose over about. Uh, who else am I missing? Brazil could end up getting into into the final. If it's not Argentina, it ends up being Brazil. It would be nice if it would be nice unless one of the two ends up second in their group. Then you end up having the possibility of an Argentina Brazil final. Portugal can get knocked out in the group stage, just like they can end up being, you know, a finalist. The, the two most solid teams going into this tournament are Brazil and Argentina. The media are starting to consume it, how commercials are being made, and, and the theme, the resonating theme behind it is how we're going to go to Qatar and win the World Cup. That's that's what they in Argentina end up saying, how we are going to do this, how we are going to do that, how Messi is the one that's carrying us through. Almost manifesting, manifesting it again and again. And saying it. Yeah, mind you, when Argentina begin to manifest that's usually not been a good sign, especially if you <laughs> yeah. look back at 2002 yeah. when yeah. all the manifestations ended up seeing them yeah. get knocked out in the first round. Yeah, uh, and, and mind you, I was living in Argentina at that point, and, okay. and when the night that Argentina got knocked out, or the morning that Argentina got knocked out in that case, hmm. um, it was just, the city was silent. Like, like you, you There's a draw with Sweden, and, right? The draw with Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah the draw with Sweden, they, there was just complete and utter, utter silence. Uh, 28 years of, of, of not winning a you know, international trophy ended last year with winning the Copa America. So, so for them, Messi already has been able to establish that legacy. This team has been able to establish a legacy themselves. Uh, so anything after that ends up being an addition because they know that it, it, it's a very difficult competition to be able to win, especially when you have a Brazil facing the moment they have and knowing that there's so many teams that can come in in good form. And at the same time, there's so many teams that are coming in limping. Cool. So I think I think before we let you go, the last two questions. One of them is sort of one of those cliched questions that we have for you. Uh, mm-hmm. That who do you who do you think is going to go win the World Cup? You have to say that before we let you go. And what's your the, the second last question that we have for you is what's your wish that you have as a fan or a follower of the Albi Celeste that that you want to see from the team at Qatar? Well, let me let me start backward. I'll I'll answer the last question first. Uh, I think my wish has pretty much already been granted. I don't I don't think i need anything else in, in order for wishes to be made uh I, like i said this is my third world cup i'm going into i'm going to be in qatar i'm going to be at the stadiums i'm going to be in front of the players i'm going to be there <laughs> to be quite uh, from a personal standpoint i don't care who wins the world cup because my country's not there i i i, I, I go i go and i, I and i um of course i wanted Colombia to be there that would be yeah. different now we'd be talking differently but yeah. uh, they're not there, so I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Would it be nice to see Messi win it? Yeah. Would it be cool to see Brazil win it? Yeah. But after that, eh, I mean, whoever wins it, yay, I'll probably be there. But yeah, good yeah. for you, you know? Yeah. But like I said, from my own personal standpoint, 
I feel fulfilled. I don't, I don't right. think I, I, I mean, if I were to die today, I, I think I've lived a professional and a personal life extremely fulfilled. So I, I really wouldn't yeah. need anything else in addition to it. I'm just adding yeah, on man. to what's been added on. <laughs> and as a fan, you know, I also uh, travel quite a bit for football and this yeah. will be my third World Cup as well. So I mm-hmm. traveled in Brazil, was in Russia, and I'll be in Qatar as well. And mm-hmm. I'll be, uh, the first match, if all goes well, it probably will be the quarterfinal uh, between Argentina and Netherlands will be my first game. So yeah, but I said, let the uh, best teams play best football and Argentina wins. <laughs> <laughs> my, my, actually, my my first my first match is the first match. I'll be yeah, I'll be yeah. there, Lusail for for nice. Ecuador Qatar. So we have a wish that you and Indra actually catch up in Qatar because both of you are going to be there in person. Yeah, at yeah. some I, point. Look, one of my one of my wishes was actually I was not very close, but I, but I was I was hoping to go to to India in the next couple of years. I actually was I was looking to to go and I'm like, Hey, you know, cause I, I have some, I have, I've met some people that do ISL commentary over there. Like, oh yeah. Yeah. So you should come I, to our I, hometown, which is Calcutta. That we are, sorry to cut you, but um, that's the equivalent of Maracana, the Salt Lake stadium that we have. It sits on you know, the well, basically played his game. Maradona yeah, made a few visits. Yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, it, it, it's people, uh, at least in this sense, like, huh, why, why would you want to do that? Because it's, <laughs> Because it's something enriching. Because it's something that that you know, at least for me, it's something that I want to do. Because I really would enjoy seeing it from a different perspective. It's not just, yeah. yeah I mean, you know, it's wonderful to go to Old Trafford. It's wonderful to go to La Bombonera. But it's also interesting to see how people. You know, why the hell do you guys support this team? I get that feeling when I was watching France versus Argentina in Sydney, Australia. Half the Brazilians were asking me, "Why are you supporting Argentina?" And there were like hundred of them. Like <laughs> it was, it was surreal experience. Like they really wanted to know what is the relation between a country which is divided by hundreds of miles, thousands of miles, and mm-hmm. I'm supporting Argentina. So it was a fascinating experience to tell them what brought me to to support Maradona, Messi. Yeah. <laughs> My, mind you, I mean, I mean, Brazil, people talk about Brazil and Argentina, these two bitter rivals. Yes, they're bitter on the pitch. Yeah. But there's just a great sense of mutual Oops. respect. One of the names that has had the most relevance or has been repeated the most and in different iterations and different spellings and different ways, but it's still the same name, is Riquelme. I was guessing oh. it was going to be good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's something over the past 15, 20 years, something like uh, 35, 40,000 children in Brazil were named. named. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. <laughs> and, and, and it's great so, that you bring it up. Remember that uh, picture of Neymar and, and Messi after the finals, right, in Copa? Yeah. Thank you so much for your time. We have two requests. Thank you. Uh, Thank one, you. one, like we mentioned, that is a road to Qatar series. Maybe at mm-hmm. some point if, at Qatar, we will just catch hold of you for one more episode later. To sort yeah, of have a sure. well, yeah. Yeah, yeah, keep me posted. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very happy to help out. Yeah, that's it. Good, that's it. great. Thank you so much. Thank Cheers. you, Juan. All right, yeah. thank you. Okay, take care. Right. Right. Yeah. Have a good Bye. one. All right, bye bye. Vamos, 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 Argentina. Hey, boludo.